I'm about to go on board the good ship Stella Solaris, which is going to take me and 900 other people out into the Caribbean to observe a total eclipse of the sun. I'll tell you more about it when we're at sea. An eclipse of the sun occurs when the moon passes in front of the sun and blocks it out for a few minutes. The trouble is, you've got to be in just the right place at just the right time, but the track of totality is very narrow. During totality, you can see the sun's atmosphere. This is a picture I took at the eclipse in Mexico of 1991. It's not only a marvellous sight, but you can make observations that can't be carried out properly at any other time. This time, the eclipse begins in the Pacific and crosses land only briefly before crossing into the Atlantic. In Britain, we got to wait until next year. So now we're steaming to our position of 12 degrees, 36 minutes north, longitude 69 degrees west. The explanation has been organized by Ted Pennis. Ted, what gave you the idea of observing eclipses from the sea? Well, Patrick, I saw my first eclipse in 1963, and I just got hooked. In 1970, there was a total eclipse visible in the eastern part of the United States, and among other places, a place called Eclipse, Virginia. And I thought, how wonderful to go to Eclipse, Virginia to see totality. And I went along with my sister, Marcy Sigler, to the uh, City Fathers of Eclipse, Virginia, and we talked them into doing a festival. Well, a few months uh, before the eclipse, they reneged on us because they thought that uh, we would bring all kinds of hippies and beer drinkers, and uh, they remembered Woodstock very, very vivid vividly, and they canceled on us. And on my way home, I was very dejected and decided uh, that I should look at something more serious. And when I looked at the 1972 eclipse, I saw it was mainly visible over water. And uh, the, on land, it was very, very limited. The cloud conditions were very severe. And I thought, why not go to a shipping company and get a ship and go out? And that's how the whole concept was born. What would you say are the main advantages of observing eclipses from ships? Well, the, the main advantage is that we have the maneuverability. A ship we can just pick up and go very, very quickly. And with today's space age technology, of uh, weather information. Everyone's here to watch the eclipse. How are you going to cope with 900 people on deck all at the same time? Well, what we do on, the, on Eclipse Day, we're going to take off uh, all the chairs, pick up the, the lounge chairs, give everybody plenty of room. I think the camaraderie, the eclipse itself, will bring people together into one big family uh, waiting for the eclipse and then the big celebration and the raising of the flag afterwards. Are you satisfied that all the passengers are well prepared? We've sent them a great deal of literature ahead of time, and we've prepared a great deal of information for them on board, and we've put together a wonderful assembly of experts like yourself, uh, and uh, I think that they're probably the best prepared passengers in the world. In the sky of, at night. So here's the grand tour of the universe with Patrick Moore. Nowadays, we know how eclipses occur, because we know how the sun, the earth, and the moon move. The ancients didn't. I mean, for example, the Chinese were inclined to think that the eclipse sun was being attacked by a hungry dragon. And the only thing to do was to scream and shout and bang gongs and beat drums and make as much noise as possible to scare the brute away. And of course, uh, it always worked. And I would say Chinese drawings of eclipses were somewhat extravagant. In the last century, it was widely believed that a small planet, Vulcan, moved around the sun closer in the Mercury. And at the eclipse of 1878, the American astronomer, Watson, believed he'd actually seen it, but alas, all he saw was an ordinary star. And then there was the eclipse of 1882. There appeared a bright comet near the sun, never seen before and never seen again. Much more recently, in the Second World War, a French party managed to slip through to the Pacific to see a total eclipse, but unfortunately made a slight mistake and went to the wrong island and missed totality. <laughs> so what to look out for? The diamond ring, then the prominences, masses of red, glowing gas rising from the sun's surface, and of course the corona, the sun's atmosphere, streaming out in all directions, a most marvellous sight. Photograph it by all means, but do remember, never look direct at the sun through any optical appliance unless it's completely eclipsed. That also applies to an SLR camera. At other times, either use a proper filter, or else project the sun, as I'm doing here. And above all, please, don't use flash. <laughs> Today, there's going to be a full-scale rehearsal for everybody, not including the sun, of course. So let's see how some of the passengers and the would-be photographers are getting on. Well, Chris, what equipment have you got? 
Um, well, I'll be using um, two cameras, uh, both with tripods. For one camera, I'll have a 600mm mirror lens, F F8, um, and for the other, a 200mm lens with a, a 2 times converter, so making it 400. What special preparations have you made? Well, basically, just, just um, making sure that everything's in order, everything's set up. You've you got film in your camera, you've got your lens cap off, that's essential. Um, that's it, just making sure, go through the programme, um, you know, what exposure you're going to take, because you really you haven't got time to think um, during the eclipse, you've only got time to, to get on with it. Now, of course, we're on board ship. What about the ship's movement? Are you going to make compensation with that? Well, yes, there'll, there'll be um, shorter exposure times for those, um, and so the ship's movement shouldn't really, the engines hopefully will be turned off, so the vibration uh, will stop. But the movement, you just have to realign the cameras every so often, to make sure you still have the, the, the eclipse in view. The best way to point your telescope at the sun is to aim it in the general direction and then move it around until the shadow cast by the telescope is at its smallest. Then you know everything is properly lined up. One man who's seen the sun from a different perspective is astronomer astronaut Dr. Ron Perez. Well, of course, the sun is, is very bright in space, just like it is from the ground. The big difference is that uh, uh, when you observe the sun from the ground, of course, we see blue sky around it, whereas in space, uh, we just see the jet black uh, background of space around it. It's very unusual looking because of that. What equipment will you be using? I normally use a, uh, a 500 millimeter telephoto lens. This is a very old lens I've had for for ages and ages. In fact, it was uh, it was old when I got it, and this is an old uh, Minolta single lens reflex camera. Uh, the the 500 millimeter telephoto gives you a, a size of the uh, moon's disk that's about a quarter of the uh, size of the 35 millimeter frame. So it gives you plenty of room around it for the corona. This time, are you looking for anything particular? Oh, nothing in particular. I. Uh, just will take a general series of pictures and I'm just a tourist here like everyone else. The official photographer is an eclipse expert. This will be George Keane's ninth successful eclipse. First of all, George, what equipment would you recommend? Well, almost anything will get an image that will be interesting uh, on the eclipse. Uh, details, prominences, other uh, key aspects of the corona, only obtained with a telescope, a long lens, that gives you a big enough image to see those details. But can people take good photographs without expensive equipment? Certainly can. Now, this, this camera is expensive. It's equipped specially for my telescope. But I've been working with other passengers today with very modest equipment and encouraging them to, to try it out. Many of the uh, point-and-shoot cameras today have a bit of a zoom lens. Uh, they can change the focal length, usually with a motor drive. And that's quite useful. Push it out to the longest focal length and try your luck. You'll get something, I'm sure. Well, what are the key things to look out for? Well, other people's equipment on deck. <laughs> uh, the one most important thing is to make sure the film is in your camera and being taken up by the take-up roll uh, at the beginning of totality, the so-called diamond ring, when the last little bit of the sun peeks through a lunar mountain, a valley uh, beside a mountain, at the limb, the edge of the moon. A second thing are details in the corona, the, the pearly, uh, glowing, whitish atmosphere of the sun, which we only see from Earth during totality. Those details are caused by the magnetic fields on the sun and they shape and, and warp and twist the corona in ways that are very interesting. Most uh, brilliant on the edge of the sun are the red hydrogen prominences. Uh, these are not always seen, and we're at a time of sunspot minimum right now, and that means the sun is not as active as it might be. Therefore, the chance of seeing a big prominence tomorrow is fairly low. But in other eclipses, they have been outstanding and uh, just oohs and ahs from the crowd as these red flames are seen uh, poking out from the limb of the sun. Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good morning. Here it is, Eclipse Day, the 26th of February. We are now only 20 miles from our planned position, and the man responsible for getting us there is our captain, Captain Apostolos Penarius. The decision was to stay 
in a position latitude 12 degrees 36 north and latitude 6900 degrees west because this position was in the center line. How quickly can you shift to a better position if it's necessary? If it's necessary, uh, we can move with all our uh, power and with a speed of around 20 knots per hour. What about keeping the ship steady during its totality? We will stop over here in this position and normally the current and the wind is coming from that position. So we will drifting slowly like this. And the man in charge of the ship's commentary during the eclipse is Dr. Ed Krupp. Ed, what do you think will you be doing? During the eclipse, I think I'm responsible for keeping people on time to warn them when it begins, when it's getting close to ending, and when it's over. This is so they look carefully and correctly with the right equipment at the right time. Have you got any special tips for people? Certainly they want to be prepared. By keeping track of the time, they know that second contact is near. The diamond ring is something that people hate to miss if there is one. And then, of course, once the eclipse opens up into full flower, people forget everything. Of the many experts on board, one of the most important is our weather expert, Dr. Ed Brooks, and he's just received the latest satellite pictures. Well, everything looks as if everything's going to work out very nicely because here we have a radar report from the whole of the Caribbean and there's not an echo anywhere on the sheet. So you think we're going to have clear skies? It looks like it. Where are we now? We are coming toward these two islands where we'll be stationed, either Curaçao or Aruba, and we'll be somewhere in that vicinity. We have a trade wind situation here with uh, high pressure to the north and fair weather, usually with divergent airflow so that there, there's very limited amount of any clouds of any consequence. We are only a few minutes away from the start of the eclipse now. First of all, we'll see the partial phase as the moon creeps across the sun. Then the sky will darken. The moon's shadow will race towards us across the ocean. We see the flash of the diamond ring, and then the prominences and the corona. Totality will seem to race by, only three minutes, 43 seconds. Then the diamond ring will flash out again, the sun will reappear, the corona will fade, and the light will come flooding back, and the glory of the eclipse will be over. First contact. You can just see the edge of the moon starting to creep onto the solar disk at about four o'clock in the clock face. Well, we are watching the eclipse. It looks as though other people are watching us. It's now half an hour since first contact, and about a quarter of the sun is hidden by the moon. The temperature dropped, and the sky is starting to darken. Others, obviously, have better things to do. Now that the sun is half covered, it's got very obviously cooler and duskier. I think this party is starting rather early. The light is fading fast. The totality is nearly on us. Any moment you see the moon shadow rushing across the sea. Approximate five seconds. Approximate five seconds. The sunlight coming through a valley on the moon's rim. The diamond ring. And totality is upon us. Now, and only now, it is safe to look direct through a telescope of the darkness. Wow! <laughs> One lovely red prominence, the almost at the top of the sun, is being from here. Prominences are huge columns of red hydrogen gas rising from the solar surface. There's one beautiful specimen there. You can notice that the image is shifting around slightly. That's because we're observing it from a moving ship deck. Glasses on. The corona spreading out from the eclipse sun. There are streamers in the corona. This is a kind of solar minimum type corona, quite different from the last one. 
you can see the structure in the corona, the coronal streamers. The sky is now purple. This is an eerie sight. Everything's gone quiet in nature. Round the body of the moon, the lovely corona with its streamers, one major prominence. You can see the corona stretching out far across the sky. It's not really dark. Many could have been darker than this. You can see the corona stretching out. The corona, remember, the sun's outer atmosphere, the very high temperature and millions of times less dense than the air we're breathing. The planets shine out too. At the sun's poles, you can see the coronal streamers coming out. This, I think, is the loveliest eclipse I have ever seen. No words can describe the beauty of this scene. There's the diamond ring. The corona fades from view. The moon shadow rushes away across the ocean. The sky lightens again. Nature seems to wake up as suddenly as she went to sleep. And you know, for a few magical moments, it was almost as though we'd been transported to another planet. I can't believe it. It was really wonderful. I mean, everything you know went dark, and everybody cheered, and it was the most magnificent thing I've seen. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just um, really glad to have actually seen some of my own eyes as well. Oh, it was spectacular. Uh, this is the first one I've ever seen. And uh, I'm just glad I came. Fantastic. Absolutely awesome. Amazing. 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 Totally. Amazing. Never. Words could not describe. <laughs> it's got to be the most amazing experience. It's awesome, really. Fantastic. I don't know what else I could hope for, except maybe twice as long. It's magic. After that marvellous eclipse, the celebration party is in full swing. Sadly, this eclipse wasn't seen from Britain. The next year, on the 11th of August, 1999, there will be one seen from the West Country. The track of totality crosses Cornwall, Devon, then Alderney, and then off into Europe. And the length of totality will be 2 minutes 6 seconds. And the whole of Britain will see a partial eclipse. But for the next totality in Britain, we've got to wait for another 90 years. And you know, eclipses are wonderful to watch. And this was undoubtedly the loveliest totality that I have ever seen. Well, as Patrick said, Wednesday is the big day and the BBC will be covering it in its entirety from 9.45 on BBC One. Back to this morning here on BBC Two, UFO, the man who came back, is next.